Hi, Martin, are you there? I'm here, yep. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, so Martin is professor of statistics and ECS at UC Berkeley. So I, I think I, I don't need to enumerate the, the long list of awards and titles that Martin has. So I, I believe many of us learned about high dimensional statistics and probability from Martin's textbook. And recently Martin begins to think about statistical theory in reinforcement learning. All right, uh, can everyone see the screen and hear me properly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much to the organizers, Mangdi and et al, for the invitation to be here, um, putting together the workshop. It looks like a, a really great lineup of speakers, um, and I'm, I'm excited to learn. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about um, a, a recent line of work on instance-dependent optimality um, that I've been doing with some collaborators uh, here at Berkeley, uh, Kulik, Ashwin, and Fung, and also uh, my colleague Mike Jordan. <clears throat> Okay, so the broad motivation for this uh, line of work is that we've seen tremendous progress in reinforcement learning, uh, particularly over the past decade or decade and a half, both in the applied and theoretical realms. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there, there's still a lot of pretty big gaps between theory and practice. Um, many algorithms that we're using in practice are behaving far better um, than existing theory would suggest. And often they're working in settings where current worst case guarantees say that they should not work, that the complexity would be completely prohibitive. Um, even other algorithms, we don't really understand at all why they work. Um, so the broad goal of, of the work that I'm talking about today is, is trying to get theoretical guarantees that align more closely with what one sees in practice. And I think ultimately, trying to get theory that will be useful to practitioners that can actually um, guide practice. <clears throat> okay, so what is the issue with um, worst case and what motivates looking at uh, what I'll call instance optimality in this talk? Um, so in statistics, there's a very standard notion of, of what's called minimax theory. It's based on decision theory where you're trying to estimate something, I'll call it theta hat throughout the talk. To be concrete, just imagine theta hat as a value function. Uh, theta star is the true unknown value function, let's say. And you're measuring with some loss function L how well your estimator is doing. Um, you take an average over the samples that you observe, you get something called the risk function. Now, the risk function of course varies as a function of the true parameter here on the x-axis. And the key question, of course, is how to scalarize it, how to give one number that tells you how good the estimator theta hat is. And there's different ways of doing this. The classical way is to take the worst case over all parameters. And that would, <clears throat> excuse me, pick off this problem here with the red star. That's the hardest problem in this toy ensemble. And it would measure estimators on this worst case risk. Um, but of course, the concern here is that that measure is not sort of meaningful for this problem here, which is somehow a much easier instance. Um, <clears throat> so people propose various ways around this. If you have a good prior over problem space, then you might compute a Bayesian risk. But what I'd like to do today is, is not put a prior. I'd like to actually discuss how to get bounds that are instance dependent. So I'll get a bound for a neighborhood around this easy problem, and I'll get a very different bound for a neighborhood around this hard problem. And that's what we mean by instance dependent bounds. Okay, so that kind of question that I've posed is, is pretty general. One can ask that about any kind of learning or estimation problem in RL. Um, today, I wanna focus on really a very simple problem, the, the most classical at all, um, which is just policy evaluation in a tabular MDP. Now you might think, well, that's just so simple, it's boring. But you'll see that when you ask questions about instance dependence, um, you start to get answers that are non-trivial. So even in such a simple setting, um, this is an interesting notion to explore. <clears throat> okay, so just reminder, a tabular MDP has, let's say capital D states. I'll look at the discounted setting. We've got a discount factor gamma. Um, we are fixing a policy trying to evaluate the associated value function, and we know that it satisfies this Bellman equation. So P 
boldface P is the transition operator unknown to us. And what we're given is we're given a set of samples RIPI, these are random quantities that are samples of the transition operator and the reward function. Um, in this talk, I'll talk mainly about the generative model. Um, so RIPI are drawn from the generative model. And we'd like to get estimates that are accurate in an L infinity norm. Uh, why is that? Well, because those are the ones that are most useful, for instance, in uh, policy optimization in, in performing incremental improvement. Okay, so standard procedures, uh, least squares, temporal differences, and se sequential TD zero. Um, least squares TD is just the batch plugin. You use your samples to form an empirical approximation to the transition matrix and an empirical approximation to the reward vector. And you plug them in the Bellman equation and you solve. Um, TD0, again, just moving quickly, I assume everyone knows this, is just linear stochastic approximation for trying to solve the batch problem. Um, it has a sequence of step sizes and typically going to zero and performs stochastic updates, one minus the step size times the previous thing and then plus the stochastic TD operator here. Okay, so when you implement TD in practice, um, of course its behavior depends a lot on what problem you apply it to. So here, what am I showing? I'm showing um, the behavior of TD zero applied to a very simple policy evaluation problem, three of them in fact, and I'm plotting number of iterations versus the L infinity error. And um, so what you can see is the algorithm's consistent. That, of course, is known from classical work back to the 80s. Um, but what's interesting, of course, is that it, its behavior depends strongly here, I'm showing with respect to the discount factor. The green curve is discount factor 0.8 up to the red 0.99. And what the point of sample complexity is, is to sort of figure out at what rate do these curves shift upwards as a function, in this case, of gamma. So we measure sample complexity by fixing some target accuracy, drawing a horizontal line. Here I'm trying to get an answer that's accurate to 10 to the minus two, looking at where the curve intersects. And obviously it's shifting to the right as gamma goes towards one. All right, so what is known about these algorithms um, from a global minimax point of view? Um, many things are known, they've been very well studied. Um, What's known is that if you have NIAD samples, let's say from the generative model, then the plug-in estimate will be accurate in L infinity with a log D from the number of states, one over square root N, and then the horizon dependence, the effective horizon is one over one minus gamma that has a factor of 1.5 when you look at L infinity norm. Equivalently, the sample complexity is growing like log D over epsilon squared, one minus gamma cubed. Okay, so that, that's the worst case complexity. And what that means is that these curves are shifting to the right as a cubic function of the um, effective horizon of the problem. They're shifting cubically in the worst case, that is. Okay, so when you do global minimax, it's always interesting to look at the proof of the result and see what is the hardest problem. There's not necessarily a uniqueest hardest problem, but um, there is a problem that will achieve the, the minimax risk. Um, so here's the, simple, the simplest but most difficult problem that we know of, and it's really a distillation of um, constructions that were due to Azar et al. and Lattimore and Hooter from 2013-14 period. Um, it's the two-state MRP. In state one, you have reward zero. State two, you have reward one. And the interesting part of it is that P, the transition probability while well, staying in state one, um, is chosen to be one minus a function of one minus gamma. So it's a quantity that's converging to one as gamma converges to one. Um, state two is absorbing with reward one. And essentially what goes on here is that because state two is um, absorbing, the optimal value function is one over one minus gamma. That gives you a factor of one minus gamma squared to sample complexity. And this choice of P, which is quite delicate, dependent on the effective horizon, gives you another factor, 
of the effective horizon. Okay, so that is a problem for which you will observe this cubic scaling. But if you look at this problem, probably your first impression is it looks pretty artificial. It's very delicately constructed. Certainly if I constructed random policy evaluation problems, they wouldn't have this kind of strange structure that this one does. Um, so that's sort of telling us that probably the behavior of the algorithm on this problem is not gonna be representative of its behavior elsewhere. Um, so that's the motivation for instance optimality. Um, we sort of understand for many problems, the global minimax risk, but we'd like to understand how algorithms behave and how their behavior varies with respect to particular problem instances. Um, so that's what I'll talk about now. So how does one formalize this? Um, well, this is something that has been formalized in statistics um, in the asymptotic setting, going back to the work of Lacombe. And more recently in non-asymptotic settings, that's actually what we're most interested in this talk, non-asymptotic meaning for a finite sample size, not letting the sample size go to infinity. Um, there's actually a fair bit of work these days in non-parametric statistics on, on that kind of question. Okay, so what are we gonna study? Well, we know that in L infinity, the, the error is going to zero at the rate one over square root n. So we're gonna rescale the error by square root n. That's allowing us to expose the constant that's in front of that term. Now, we can't just ask about for a fixed problem what the best estimator is because for a fixed problem, the best estimator just ignores the data and returns the true value function. So one has to do some kind of averaging or worst case, but the, the key is we're gonna do this over very specially chosen local subsets here. And then to get minimax, the minim means that we take the infimum over all possible estimators. So not just TD or not just LSTD, you can do whatever you like with the data you observe. We'd like to understand what the fundamental limits are. Okay, so it's, it's really in this theory, it's the choice of this neighborhood that is key, this local neighborhood. In global minimax, this is not a local neighborhood, it's the entire problem space. But in um, local instance optimality, we choose this in particular ways. In the Lacombe theory, what one does is you define a neighborhood at scale S that is shrinking at rate one over root N. Um, and you ask that your algorithm performs well over problems that belong to this very small but shrinking neighborhood. Um, in this problem, square root n is the right rate to shrink the neighborhood because we know that the risk is going to zero at square root, uh, the rate one over square root n. For non-asymptotic bounds, we're gonna do something else. We're gonna take just a worst case over two point families. So for a given problem, call it script J, we're just gonna measure how well you do on J and some other instance that we're gonna choose. That instance is, is typically gonna be chosen quite close to J. It's gonna be in a very small neighborhood of J because if it was very far away, it would be easy to tell them apart. All right, so that's the notion of instance optimality. What can we say for policy evaluation? Okay, so we're gonna fix an instance, which is parameterized by a transition matrix P and a reward function R. We're gonna have N IID samples for this result. And we define what's known as the optimal covariance matrix. So what is it? It has the covariance of your optimal value function under the action of your sampling mechanism. PI is a random matrix sampled P is the transition operator deterministic. It has the covariance of however you're sampling your rewards. This could be zero if it's deterministic, but otherwise you have some non-trivial covariance if you have a stochastic reward mechanism. And then it has prefactors of identity minus gamma P inverse, right? So these of course are doing the natural thing that you'd expect that's measuring how when I make errors at one particular um, iteration of the Markov chain, how do those errors compound over time via powers of the transition operator? Okay, so sort of obvious that this should be the thing if you do a little calculation, um, but here's what you can prove. You can prove asymptotically if you let n go to infinity and you look over a Lacombe neighborhood, then 
the L infinity risk is equal to the expectation of a Gaussian that's zero mean and has exactly this covariance. Okay, so that's an asymptotic expression because it's requiring that n is large, but it's exact. Okay, that is the, the best that you can do with any procedure um, whatsoever. That's relatively easy to prove just using standard Lacombe techniques. Um, more challenging to prove is the following non-asymptotic bound. Um, what this bound says is that once the sample size n is big enough, it has to be bigger than 1 minus gamma to the minus 2. Um, that's a reasonable level because if you have stochastic rewards, you can't actually get consistent estimates um, unless you have n at least that large. And then what it says is if you look at just the worst case in a two-point neighborhood of your instance, your minimax risk is some constant, a half, something like that, times the, the maximal, um, should be the square root of the maximal diagonal of this quantity. Okay, so that's, that's a bound that holds for finite samples and again for, for any estimator. All right, so now what becomes interesting, now we understand that this object here is the fundamental quantity, and it becomes interesting to sort of look at how it varies over possible instances that we might be looking at. Um, here's a slightly larger sandbox. Um, by the way, I'm not obsessed with two-state Markov decision processes or this particular one. It's just that I like to have very simple illustrations that show the behavior of theory. And this is the simplest illustration that we could work out. So it's a, essentially, it's an extension of the previous worst case instance, where now what we've done is we've added, instead of the reward being one here, I've made it one minus gamma to some power of lambda bigger than zero. If you put lambda equals zero, that's the previous worst case instance. But as lambda grows, what happens is that this reward shrinks and it approaches this reward. And so as that happens, the variance of the policy evaluation problem shrinks. The problem becomes easier and easier as a function of this gamma. So what you can actually prove as a corollary of that previous result is that um, the worst case complexity over this family as a function of gamma and lambda looks like the effective horizon to the power 1.5, but minus lambda. So if lambda is zero, that's the worst case instance, that's globally minimax. But as lambda increases, the problem gets much easier. Okay, so we're gonna look at the behavior of TD on this class of problems. Um, so what we'd like to understand, is TD actually optimal? Um, somehow asking whether TD is optimal is a bit of a straw man. It's, it's sort of obvious if you look at stochastic approximation theory from the 70s and 80s that it will not be optimal. Um, the more natural question to ask is TD learning optimal when you combine it with Pol polyak rupert averaging? And that's just a, a simple but ultimately quite useful scheme where you run the ordinary TD updates that's generating this sequence theta hat and then you just average along the path. That's called polyak rupert averaging. And why do you do this? Well, you do this because it allows you to run the base TD algorithm here with a much more aggressive step size. For instance, even constant step sizes are, are okay. Um, so this algorithm with a constant step size is gonna have very high variance. It's gonna be very noisy, but it's gonna move very quickly. And then the averaging is obviously a form of variance reduction. Um, and it was the insight of Rupert and then Polyak to, to actually prove things um, about these kinds of schemes. Um, so we can ask, is TD0 with PR averaging an instance optimal algorithm? Um, that's a bit of a trick question because if you just do the sort of classical kind of asymptotic scaling where the sample size goes to infinity, um, it's not hard to show that it is asymptotically instance optimal. But one thing we've learned from high dimensional statistics is that asymptotics can be very misleading. Um, so in high dimensional statistics, we do very different things. We do things like this. We um, take a sequence of sample sizes that is going to, to infinity, 
but it's going to infinity only because some other problem parameter, for instance, here, the discount parameter gamma is going to one. So what I'm doing is looking at sequences of problems that are indexed by the complexity. As the complexity grows, I'm giving you more samples. I'm recognizing that it's a harder problem. I will give you more samples, but still a finite number of samples for any problem. And I'm actually giving you enough samples that in terms of global minimax, you, for any problem, you should be able to obtain constant error with this many samples. Now, what am I doing? I'm actually doing a simulation for a problem that's easy. I'm simulating for lambda is 1.5 in this sandbox here. So lambda is 1.5. And what that means is the minimax risk is actually constant as a function of the effective horizon. And because I'm giving you square root n, I'm giving you n samples that scales with the effective horizon, then actually the lower bound, which is in green, these problems are getting easier as a function of gamma. And that's what the lower bound tells us, that you're getting lower and lower error. So at the highest choice of gamma, you see roughly a factor of four uh, difference. This is an order of magnitude in terms of log error between these are TDPR curves with either a constant step size or a polynomial step size. OK, so this tells you that not all asymptotically optimal algorithms are equal. All right, all of these algorithms are asymptotically optimal, but the black algorithm, which I'll tell you about, is clearly much better than TD PR averaging in this particular regime. All right, so that's interesting to learn that TD and PR averaging is not um, an instance optimal algorithm um, in finite samples. All right, so how does one get an instance optimal algorithm? Um, the answer of what you would try is actually pretty straightforward. It's the analysis that turns out to be rather delicate in our work. Um, as I mentioned before, PR averaging is one form of variance reduction, but we know many kinds of variance reduction in stochastic approximation schemes. And so-called direct variance reduction techniques are very well known in stochastic optimization where they first appeared about 10 years ago. And they've been used increasingly in reinforcement learning um, in the past few years for problems, both for TD and for um, Q learning, uh, for instance, the paper by Sidford et al. Um, I won't go into detail just because I don't have time, but just high level, what are these algorithms doing? Um, T hat is my short form for the uh, random TD operator based on a particular sample I. Um, what these algorithms are doing is at every epoch, um, often they're epoch based, they're maintaining a, a recentering point that's computed. And they're taking the TD update and they're recentering it by subtracting the TD update applied to the, the theta bar, the recentering point and then adding back in a term, T twiddle is an unbiased approximation to the full Bellman update. Um, the reason they're doing this is to reduce variance. Uh, you can do some calculations to see that the variance of this update shrinks as theta and theta bar approach the truth, the theta star. Okay, so what we can show, so again, this idea is not new, but the analysis um, I believe is new here, is that if you use a suitable choice of the step sizes and the epochs, um, there's some details here that I'm skipping over, but they're, they're all in the paper that's cited there. Then if you run this variance reduced form of policy evaluation using a total of n samples, um, what you'll get is you will get an estimate that an L infinity norm is less than or equal to a constant plus something that's smaller order than this quantity here. And this quantity has the terms that you expect. It has log D over square root N, and it has the diagonal, should actually be a square root of this diagonal, my, my apologies, has the square root of the diagonal of the um, optimal asymptotic covariance matrix. Uh, what's okay, so this is saying that this is an instance optimal procedure um, up to some constants, possibly log factors that we don't have full control over. What's sort of key is that it's depending exactly on this um, optimal covariance 
that's identified um, in the lower bounds. Uh, excuse me, uh, what's capital D? Capital D is the number of states in the tabular M MRP. So you get a log D from the union bound. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> um, so something we don't know how to fix is that this requires the sample size to be larger than log D, that's fine. But one minus gamma to the cube. Um, you'd like to reduce that to one minus gamma squared. That's what we see in the lower bound, but currently we don't know how to do that. Okay, so that's the theorem. And you can see from our, our simulations that it is indeed matching the lower bound. So these diamonds here are showing you the behavior of the variance reduced policy evaluation algorithm and computing a slope. This slope will be minus 1.5. And that's exactly what the minimax theory, the instance dependent minimax theory um, suggests. So we've proved a, a general result, but just in simulations, here's another instance where again, forms of TD and PR are, are very clearly suboptimal. And this is achieving um, this kind of instance dependent lower bound for these easier problems. Okay, so let me just start to wrap up. So up to now I've been talking about, um, we've identified the sort of correct functional to look at when we just study instance dependence and policy evaluation. Um, I motivated the talk by saying that we were interested in um, providing bounds that are useful in practice. Um, that's actually a deficiency of what I've discussed so far. This optimal covariance depends on things that are not known. Um, for a practitioner, you'd like things a bound that depends only on known quantities. Um, we don't yet know how to do that for TD0. I'm pretty sure you can do it by studying the um, sequence of iterates. But um, for the plug-in quantity for LSTD, we, we do have a bound that depends purely on known quantities. It depends on the empirical transition matrix, and it depends on the empirical stand standard deviation of the Bellman update. Um, this is a bound where the rewards are um, not stochastic. So there's, there's no terms for that in the way I've stated it here. Okay, so this is different, right? This is a bound that is actually useful to the practitioner because everything this bound can be evaluated. There's an explicit, not unreasonable choice of the constant C. And this is something that purely based on your batch of data, you can evaluate. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, there's a slight deficiency that this quantity is not always matching this quantity. Um, essentially, we, we have a square root in the wrong place that we'd like to fix. Um, so th there's interesting questions here. Roughly speaking, what you'd like to do is replace p by p hat and replace covariance by covariance hat. And you'd like to prove things based on, on the sample dependent version. So that's that's something where we have partial results, but it's not complete. All right, so just to wrap up, um, this talk was sort of motivated by, by a more general question, which I think is interesting, which is that of sort of closing gaps between worst case theory and algorithms in practice. Um, what we did is derived lower bounds in both um, asymptotic and finite sample settings for policy evaluation. Interestingly, TD learning, even with policy, with polyrec Rupert averaging, this is not instance optimal in finite samples. It is asymptotically optimal, just using known results um, due to Polyak and Uditsky. But when you actually study it more carefully in this kind of high dimensional statistics scaling, um, we see suboptimalities. Um, variance reduced PE fixes those suboptimalities. Now, I think there's maybe more open questions raised by this work than answered. Um, obviously, we've studied only the generative setting. We'd like to do things in Markov settings that brings in mixing times. It's not clear whether one should do things in L infinity. Perhaps we should be doing things in, in an L2 mu norm where mu is the stationary measure. Um, we can say something about a linear function approximation where that's how LSTD is, is actually used. But again, thinking about function approximation more generally, um, 
require some new things. The, the lower bounds will hold more generally, but the variance reduction or analysis of it actually uses certain details that are quite specific to policy evaluation. Um, but I guess in general, I'm quite excited about um, understanding instance optimality in, in much more general settings. I, I sort of view this as um, an initial set of steps in that direction. So a couple of preprints, um, papers and preprints for those of you interested and um, happy to take any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Martin. So let's open up the discussions. So anyone who has a question, I think you can either ask in the Q&A uh, chat box, or you can just unmute yourself. Uh, Yuxiang, are you there? I thought you want to ask something. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, um, I have uh, many questions, but I wanted to first ask the question to Shai. Uh, um, so, um, well, uh, in your talk, you, you studied a very interesting problem uh, of the behavior policy and target policy having different um, like information. Uh, in, in specifically, the, the, the behavior policy might depend on uh, like the unknown state, but in the target policy, you wanted to um, like evaluate a palm dp policy right so so i uh, if i understand correctly that's the setting um but um i i'm i'm wondering like whether the the problem of both the behavior policy and the target policy are palm dp policies with the same information a kind of a more reasonable setting um, because you can you can either observe um the state or observe certain information of the state and, and that should be shared among policies if you want to do this more generally there's a two by two table of settings according to the partial or full observa uh, observability of the two policies. And in the simplest case, when they share the same information, like perhaps um, the, the existing literature on OPE would work and there's no confounding issues. Like, is that a right comment? I just wanted to hear what you think about this problem. So, so the comment is, uh, is correct. Uh, um, I mean, the, the, the issue though is that uh, at least in applications, uh, we have a big yeah. study and some a medical application that um, I didn't uh, say anything about. Uh, um, this is really not the case. Uh, the, the, the doctors, when they see, actually see the patients and feel their, the patient's pulse and look at their, uh, if they smile or, or not, then uh, they, know, uh, they know a lot more. So uh, they do make decisions uh, we cannot explain uh, by uh, their, their data. I see, I see, I see. So it's a well-motivated problem, and thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I have another question to to Martin. Um, um, so, uh, so I'm wondering whether it's just a simple uh, MLE plugging, right? So, so you estimate the MDP parameters and plugging, um, like that should um, have like instance optimality, right? I think Mondi is going to be be talking about that later this afternoon. Um, but, but are, are there um, like specific advantages um, of using the variance re re reduced uh, TD uh, over the standard uh, like plugging estimate. Well, yeah, so the plugin estimate of course is not stochastic approximation. So it doesn't suffer from some of these problems that an online algorithm does. Um, to my knowledge, I'm pretty sure the plugin is instance optimal. Um, but as I mentioned, my results with Ashwin don't actually show full instance optimality. I, I think as far as I know, that's open. Um, but I, I think in practice, well, this problem is so toy that it doesn't really matter. But moving to more realistic pr problems, we want to do online procedures. So somehow understanding optimal online procedures, I, I think, is quite interesting. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so I will ask a question on behalf of Emma because she's she has to go for a meeting. So, so this is uh, to shy. So, so basically, when we have confounding uh, factors and partial observabilities, is like batch RL could be statistically intractable, right? And then to get around of this, we need some sort of decoupling. So, what do you think? Uh, do you think like shall shall we just try to get this kind of decoupling assumption from domain experts? Or how do we, can we try to evaluate assumptions directly from data? 
I mean, so, so that, that's a good question. In principle, you could uh, uh, try to do it from data, but you will need a heck of a lot of uh, data uh, to evaluate uh, um, conditional independence. So, so uh, domain expert is a good way to start, but I think uh, from a theory perspective, uh, a really interesting question is what if you, we can measure the level of decoupledness? And uh, um, but there has been works in the, in the CI literature about, about that, and, uh, uh, but still we haven't been able to, uh, uh, to wrap our heads around it. Because mm -hmm. testing independence requires a lot of data, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so it's, it's hard to draw a line between what's known and what's not known. Right, unless you make some pretty, uh, pretty uh, outrageous assumptions uh, on the shape of the distribution, then, then you, uh, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shai. And uh, also, I have a question for Yuan Dong. So, uh, Yuan Dong, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, so there's a question in the chat about so how do you define the optimal site of the agent? Do you want to repeat the definition of site? Oh, yeah. So I think I already uh, replied that in a thread, uh, but I'm going to talk about that. So I think this actually related to the theory. So the, 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 the theorem one in the first part of the slides, basically there's a constant CND here. So it will depend on like if the site is larger, uh, then this CND will become also like, a, 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 I mean, for example, like a, a larger, right? So in that case, the bond will be uh, stronger. So that's basically like the trade-off. I mean, if, if, you, if one agent only see like a, a very small uh, local uh, region and a, lot, lot, a very small like a local uh, states, number of states from other agents nearby, then the, the bond will be looser. So that's basically a trade-off. <laughs> And also, there's one thing I, I didn't, I think I, I might have missed. So how did you get around with this exponential complexity? Was there any assumption about how, how the agents sort of like decompose the state space naturally? Yeah, so basically the assumption here is uh, each agent, once they have their own rewards, they will go to basically go there and then uh, you, you basically pick the reward that you get. That's the best thing you can do. Right. So, for example, you basically say that uh, for each of the agent, you you have to basically pick, for example, uh, the closest uh, rewards. If you're picking like a very far away rewards, then because of discount factor, the discount factor will prevent you from doing that because uh, this is actually not optimal. Mm -hmm. Because of this kind of property, you can say, okay, maybe each agent just pick object that is nearby or finish a task that is closer to it. So this actually enabled the disbound. So that's the reason. Okay. So, so there is some notion of locality that no. makes it work. Yes, exactly. Also, the locality basically means that how much, how, how, how many steps you're going from one position to another position, right? And this locality basically enabled this kind of composition. Uh -huh. Great, that makes sense. Okay, okay yeah. So, so I also have a question for Martin. So Martin, so uh, you explained, so why do we need to care about this localized min-max risk, right? So um, I, I think, uh, so we need a notion of neighborhood of instances, right? So would that particular notion of neighborhood, uh, is that important here? For example, like in your result, so can we just pick an, a, an arbitrary norm to define the neighborhood or would that change the rate? Um. So in the Lacombe theory, because you're taking limits and the neighborhood is going to zero, the choice of the norm is, is actually irrelevant. All that matters is that it goes to zero at sort of the right rate. In this case, it's a parametric problem. So one over square root n. Um, in the other um, non-asymptotic bound, we proved the neighborhood is just two point. So there's no sort of norm. Um, the, the worst case two point problem obviously involves a you, the problem you're studying and a problem very close to it mm -hmm. because it's not hard to give the algorithm a problem very far away because it can just test and figure out which problem it's looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding is like the, there will be some issue if we consider non-asymptotic bounds, right? If we only care about asymptotic error bounds, it sort of doesn't really change much in the, in the mean result. Yeah, I, I think one message from my talk is that there are a lot of algorithms, for instance, you know, arguably TD plus PR is a very simple algorithm. It's, it's very easy to implement PR averaging. It is asymptotically optimal, um, but as you can see it, in finite samples, it's dominated by orders of magnitude by another algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, the, the form of variance reduction that we analyze these epoch-based algorithms, um, if you've ever implemented them, they're a pain in the ass. That this is sort of 
honesty in application. Mm -hmm. Be much better to um, be able to prove something about the more online versions of variance reduction that people know in stochastic optimization. I, I think those are, are much better. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, that plot I showed you with, you know, several orders of magnitude difference is telling you that these things matter. Um, we're yes. sort of actually looking at higher order terms really, mm -hmm. but higher order terms matter with finite samples, can matter with finite samples. Mm -hmm. and, and also the, the finite sample size condition about this, this condition on N is not entirely ironed out, right? It's not entirely what? It's not yeah. entire, entirely ironed out. Mm -hmm. So it was, we don't, it's not tight yet, right? No, it's not tight. We, so our analysis a, of variance reduction needs a larger sample size than the lower bound would suggest. Mm -hmm. So right, right, yeah, that's yeah, we, we don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so do we have, any further question? Let me look at the Q and A chat box. Or does anyone want to ask questions? Like, yeah, sure. well, I guess I guess um, Martin. Um, yeah, it, beautiful work. I'm, I'm looking forward to following up. Um, I, I what? Yeah, one question I did have throughout was how complex it is to run these things, and I guess I guess that's somehow factored in on your bounds, like how just the overhead and running these algorithms. Um, and the other comment I wanted to make is this class of problems you're looking at, the only thing that creates that one over one minus gamma difficulty is that the value function has a constant in it that grows like one over one minus gamma. So if you subtract off a constant, it suddenly becomes much more tame. I mean, maybe, I could, maybe you could comment on that. I mean, it's really only one dimensional problem that's causing the trouble. Um. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. Just to yeah, be clear, I'm, yeah. I'm not that interested in the one minus gamma yeah, scaling yeah. alone. I just yeah. chose it because it's, it's a sort of a one dimensional way to show very big differences in the instance um, dependence. Um, at some level, I think studying, like if you look at those two toy instances I gave, they're very artificial. Like as you pointed out, you have an absorbing state with sort of a value function that's growing at the worst possible rate. And then the problems are sort of quasi-deterministic. Um, yeah. Most other problems are much, much, much easier than this. So yeah. that's sort of a, a message I think that's useful is that the worst case theory is, is very conservative in this case. Yeah, I just, but, I, but I love this toy and I wonder how much I'll be able to play with it. Like control variance with such a letdown because the theory is so beautiful and yet it's, it's often the overhead of applying them is so massive that you don't get to use them. And so do you have faith that these will actually be things that will be, you could actually plug in and get well, into huge I mean, benefits? The variance reduction, to be clear about what's unpleasant, it's, it's not more expensive by any means. What's yeah. unpleasant is that it has parameters. It has epochs and epochs have lengths and it has step sizes within epochs and there's sort of a lot going on. Like the beauty yeah. of TD plus PR is you just throw in an, a constant step size and you average it. It's just yeah. plug and play you know, a monkey could <laughs> implement that algorithm. Yeah. That's not yeah. true for the, these well, epics. In, in the linear case, the nonlinear algorithms, it's it's pretty horrible as well. If you have PR oh, okay, do. yeah, true. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah my yeah. case that I talked about today is very special because yeah. of linearity. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. But, but as I said, there, there are other forms of this variance reduction in stochastic optimization that are much more amenable to implementation. My, my suspicion mm -hmm. is one can adapt this kind of analysis to the more general fixed point setting in stochastic approximation. I think that's quite interesting to think about. Yeah. Okay. But thanks uh, for your question, Sean. Appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, any more question? Okay. Maybe we shall uh, take a small break and we'll be back here in 15 minutes. Thank the old speakers again for the beautiful talks. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Mundi. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.